It's a dank and dreary Thursday in fertility podcast world. Hello and welcome. I'm Natalie Silverman, your host, well, one of your hosts, more on that in a moment. If you've just recently found the Fertility Podcast, welcome in, come on in. And I say that because this last weekend I was hosting the Let's Talk Fertility stage in London at the Fertility Show and got to meet lots of people, got to chat with some of you who listen to the podcast. Do you know what? It almost makes me a bit teary when I get to meet someone like you who's come up and said, I listen every day, all your podcasts really help me. And you know what would be amazing is if you listen to this podcast and it has made a difference, if you could just take a little moment and subscribe to it and rate and review it and then share it, then other people will get to hear what you hear and what you enjoy. And I've actually just come off the phone from a lady who I'm doing some other work with and she was telling me how she's been through early menopause and how she had no idea that this was a thing that could happen. There's so much more we can do about our fertility education. And if you follow me on my socials at Fertility Body, you'll know that this week I've shared um, a new campaign, which is a fertility education campaign. It's a poster, and I'm going to put a link to it in the show notes for this episode. It's a poster, which is all about, there's nine points about your fertility. And I think the more of us that can share it, there's loads of brilliant campaigns, and I'm sure you've heard of, of many of them. But the visual aspect of this is it's really kind of easy to share. And Professor Joyce Harper, who you'll be hearing more on this podcast soon once I've pinned her down, she's behind it. They've been to the European Parliament talking about it, trying to get fertility education talked about more prominently. And um, what they're asking for you to do with the poster is to take a selfie and to share it. So like I say, listen to the end, get the details of the show notes so that you can share it too. Now, the other thing I just wanted to say was if you've been listening to this podcast for a while, this episode's coming to you in November in 2019. Back in June, the lovely Kate Davis, who is my co-host, joined me on this podcast and we started sharing the podcast on UK Health Radio with the show being called Talk Fertility and that's changed. We're not doing that anymore. So what you're going to hear is the podcast as was as you knew it before with just a bit of banter and then experts or stories being shared but just not any other names if that confused you don't worry about it it was just we were putting the podcast in a different place for a while to see how it went the podcast goes out on all podcast channels and this was just another way of doing it and it got a bit confusing for us (laughs) so we're we're just going back to to basics really Kate and I we live in two different places and we record remotely. We've actually got a day next week where we're recording in the same place, which is really exciting. So expect some very exciting new intros to this podcast. Expect Isla, the dog, to be featured. Yeah, just keep an eye on our socials because one thing that we did during Fertility Awareness Week was midweek, we just did an Insta Live asking if you were okay. Kate is a fertility nurse consultant and IVF coach and she's got loads of experience and she's so wise and we just wanted to make sure that you're okay because a lot of what was being talked about whilst amazing was also quite triggering and also ties in very nicely with something that Kate's been talking about which is being a fertility warrior not a worrier and she was giving some coping mechanisms whilst we did our little Insta Live. We're planning some more of them so like I say keep an eye on our socials all the details of how you can follow us will be in our show notes and Kate has also been sharing her become a fertility warrior not a worrier knowledge with Fertility Box who you may remember we spoke to as part of our Meet the Makers series and I'll put a link to that chat in the show notes but Kate has given those tips in the Fertility Box box that you get this month and I've just received mine And I wanted to give them a little mention. Now, the thing about Fertilibox is they've got this toxin-free promise, as well as a natural, a cruelty-free and a transparency promise. They really have done their homework and they've made this naughty list where you can actually look at the products you use. I'm a bit scared of doing this, but you can see what toxins and chemicals you should be trying to avoid whilst you're trying to conceive And I didn't realise till meeting these girls and talking about it, how much stuff we plaster on ourselves as well as putting in ourselves. So if you're trying to do all you can to get pregnant naturally, which is the ideal, even if you're going through treatment and you want to give yourself the best shot, it's a really good way to overhaul what you're doing. You know, really 
put yourself in the best place possible with all different elements plus getting a monthly box full of gorgeous products only going to make you feel better and feeling better is one of the things that this podcast tries to make you do and the Fertility Box ladies have very kindly given me a discount code to give to you so if you visit fertilibox.co.uk and you feel like subscribing then use this code fertilitypoddy25 and it'll give you 25% off how nice is that I will put that in the show notes too in my lovely fertility box box which I'm going to be putting on my socials I've got a lovely candle from Hunter's Moon I've got some Skin Ivana beauty oil uh, some make foot cream some lovely lip gloss from Lavera. I haven't tried any of this I've just opened the box and I've got some Bear Biology Omega 3 fish oil And the brilliant thing is, is that Fertility Box have got some amazing experts who have all commented on the products. So you really are getting stuff that's got expert advice behind it. Not only that, but there's a chicken stew recipe from Melanie Brown, who's been a previous guest on this episode. If you've forgotten that code for discount, it's fertilitypoddy25. Make sure you listen to the end to get the show notes and I'll make sure I give you that code again, a link to the chat I did with the girls where you can find out all their story and why they set it up. Plus, I don't want you to miss out on any of the stuff I've been yabbering on about right now. However, I'm now going to let you enjoy the show. I'm really looking forward to this next conversation, actually, Kate. Another Kate. Mm. We're going to be talking to uh, author Kate Kaufman. Her book is Do You Have Kids? Life When the Answer Is No. And I love that when Kate and I were both sent the books and we checked in with each other to see how far we'd got reading it, we'd both got to the same page at first, hadn't we? That's a bit spooky, isn't it? (laughs) It was weird. (laughs) Yeah, it was. Yeah, a good book. Not, I didn't get through at that point as far as I'd like to have done. Um... But I've since kind of motored on a bit and, yeah, I'm enjoying it. Well, she gives a really interesting perspective, which we will talk with Kate more about, um, mm. in a lot of the kind of societal viewpoints, I think, on on women without children, with, which I think is a massive conversation. But we'll get her on, we'll have a chat, and uh, we'll find out more. So we're now going to welcome Kate Hoffman to the podcast. Kate's book, Do You Have Kids? Life When the Answer Is No?, is one that Kate and I, the other Kate, Kate Davis, have both been working our way through. I've been highlighting it, and Kate, I know you have been too. There's there's so much Mm -hmm. here. First of all, Kate, welcome to the podcast. It's lovely to have you here. Oh, delighted to be here. Thank you. And thank you for getting in touch, because this book is a really fascinating insight. There's so many different themes that I know Kate and I want to explore. But as a starting point... I just want to get a bit more about you and the point in which you realised that your life was going to be childless and not by choice and what that kind of realisation was and what happened next. Well, let's see. I um, was married and my husband and I decided that we wanted to try for kids. And we tried with great zeal because that's how I do life. And um, I was in my, probably my early 30s <laughs> at the time. We'd been married for a bit and nothing happened. And this was back in the probably mid to late 80s. And so we ended up going through infertility workups, which I know happen pretty much the same way now. And um, the issue was me. I, I had luteal phase defect, and later on we found I had significant endometriosis. That was uh, through all those wonderful terms that I thought I'd forgotten, but I do remember, and all the drugs that I thought I'd forgotten and I do remember. We came to a time when it was not happening, and we were both getting older, and I believe the next step for us was IVF, and that was at such early stages. And so it was something that uh, we just, between the two of us, was too far, and I was a mess by then, and so we stepped off. Probably by then I was in my early 40s. And that's what brought me to the stage of not having kids, and our response was to move to the country, And when we moved to the country, I met no one who didn't have children. And so I became just living immersed. Later, I realized it was really an immersion journalism kind of an experience that helped me really build the appetite for, and and more than an appetite, just an urge for finding people like me, 
primarily older people who had been along this path before, so they could give me an idea of how to even put a blueprint together for a life that I didn't think I was going to be leading. And in your book, you, you speak to obviously so many women, and I guess these women are the, the, the your blueprint that you're talking about. How many did you actually speak to? Because I'm sure they didn't all make it into the book, but there's an awful lot of women there that did. Well, 40 women made it into the book, and they range in their ages from their 20s to their 90s. And I did formal interviews with well over 100 women, and then prior to that, as I went out at literally recruiting for people who didn't have kids, and of course I was stealthy about it, I would you know, listen to if they were talking about kids, and then I would kind of gingerly move into the topic, and v- gradually over time, and this is spanning probably at least a decade, I, would f- I-, I finally found the woman who I ended up having the walk on the beach with that opened the book in which we both discovered that we didn't have children. She by choice and I by circumstance. And we ended up gathering over time, periodically, once every, probably once every quarter, groups of women that didn't have kids for conversations. And that's where I found some, a few of the women that I interviewed, but what it did really was provide a focus group, a series of focus groups that showed me that this was Having a place to be able to speak in a respectful, facilitated way that had enough room for everyone to express their own stories in whatever way was appropriate at the time really did set the stage not only for me to learn that this was an important process, but for every single woman, it was the first time they'd ever given any real voice to their own stories. Because you make it very clear at the start of the book that nowhere in the book is criticism of mothers for having children or any value judgment. And it really comes across sensitively. And I think when you're dealing with such still a a subject that we don't really know how to talk about, talking about it, it just has to be, I think, put out there for us to try and gauge more understanding and what I loved about the book was the stats and the facts and figures that you put in there about the sheer numbers of women without children of which you quite rightly say are everywhere was there a surprising kind of part of the conversations that you were having with these women or was there a story or a few scenarios that caught you off guard in what people were were willing to share or or sharing what they'd been through? In terms of the actual content, all of the content was so, so rich in both its variety and its commonality. But what to me has been the most surprising is how, how, though even now we don't talk about it much, the stories and the urge to be heard is sitting right below the surface And all it needs is someone to open a door in a safe, respectful, interested, and open-hearted way. And so it wasn't so much a particular storyline that resonated, but was that, that desire to fill a space in the world that had not for anyone been well-defined and openly embraced. One of your ladies that you interviewed, I think it was Laura, one quote that she said that really kind of, I guess, I found really powerful when she was talking about friendships and how she, I think she, she, her best friend or a friend had told her that she was having a baby and she said that she cried and she had this knowing, utter knowing that her friend was going to disappear into motherhood. And she thought, in her words, I'm I'm losing my friend. And I just thought that was really interesting how, for women, how having a baby can really affect your friendships and how I think you alluded to the fact that you've lost friends through motherhood, because of motherhood. Yes, and I think necessarily so. The friendships need to change. One of the successful friendship stories was another woman in the book who... The woman that was her close friend was also, I believe she was a doula. She may have been a midwife. But before the birth of the friend's children and during the early times of the friends raising her babies, they kept the conversation going. So they set up an intention prior to the birth 
of the children, and then they renewed and adjusted the intention over the course of the children's growing in such a way as it became it became a friendship that morphed and changed in such a way as to include both perspectives so that that friendship has not only endured, that friendship has deepened. I think that's another takeaway that I have from this is that that we do have so many things to learn from each other. If we can, as we're able, go into those spaces that are different than our own experiences, when we're being accepted for our own, that's when we hit the sweet spot of being able to find some of the, the real close connections that I think we all seek and, in, and can help fill the spaces that we each have. Because when you have kids, you lose other aspects of yourself that I think, think sometimes we can be some guides back into the mother's lives that may have been had they not had children as well, if we can do it kindly and lovingly. The one thing that really did strike me, though, was how talking with women older than I was so, it was so fulfilling for them to be heard so closely and with so much interest. And what I have found is that through the conversations, particularly with the women in their, I'm in my 60s now, but in their 70s, 80s, and 90s, that now I have these connections with elder women that are filling that space. You know, we can't go and ask our mothers about this, but we can ask elder women. And because they've lived their whole lives like this, there's a level of acceptance and integration and graciousness that creates nothing as off limits about how their lives have been impacted. That I have found myself not only going back and reading their sections in my book, which I love my book, I keep going back and, and consulting it, but also now that I have access to them as guides, mentors, and in some ways, mothers of the heart in a completely different way than my own mother could ever have felt. When we're going through the trying for a child, it's so very clear where we are and where our destination is that we sometimes, I know I certainly did, lost some of the nuance about all of the subtleties that are circling around what it was like before, what it's like during, what it could be afterwards. We cut ourselves into these little pieces of differences. And if we just look at it through a slightly different lens, we get to find places of commonality and learning. I think the adjusting of perspective becomes crucially important to the, the grieving, the healing, and the integration process. And I didn't come up with this on my own. It was something that I, I realized after having the number of conversations and the frank conversations with so many different people. Just when you're talking about that commonality, there was a really poignant point that you, you go into quite a bit of detail on. And it was so strange because I'd had a conversation with a friend of mine just before I read this part in your book. You talked about co-housing and shared living and this idea, which I love, and I want my friends to kind of get her head around it, maybe, about how shared housing is ideal for women who don't have children. And I love this. You say, Michelle, you were talking about, Michelle thinks, especially for those who are single, you can create networks of people who you can rely on. Single women can age together into their golden years and even beyond. Now, I'd had a conversation, Kate, with a, a single friend of mine who was talking to me about how she has to accept that this is how it's going to be, her being on her own and potentially not having children. She has to accept it. And I was talking to her about her use of language and that it was quite finite and that it might not be like that. Who knows that she, because she was talking about coming home and being on her own and how that was hard. And I just loved that reframing and that moving towards the idea. And of course, it's not going to be for everybody, but just to suggest it and then dedicate the time to it. And I know that you ref reference various studies and there's different countries that are, are, are big into the, the communal living and, and you know, I, I all for it but just thinking differently about what this looks like I know is a huge part of obviously where you're at now in the communities that you're in and we'll talk about that in a moment but that that shared living um I mean there was predominantly positive feedback from most of the people that you've spoken to about it as an option wasn't there well, there was, and I love the way that you're saying it. You consider it, and that is a, a source of learning in and of itself. And I also appreciate how you call out the different partnering statuses that we may be in a partnership at some points in our lives, 
it's highly likely that even if we are, there'll be other times in our lives when we won't be in partnership. And one of the learnings that we have by going through life without having children is that we know that there are certain things that are not included. And I think sometimes that gives us a, a resiliency or a flexibility that we don't even know we have. It's something that we grow into. So yes, co-housing is a perfect example of that. You, you live in a different arrangement than being strictly on your own and thereby get to learn, does that work for you or does it not? How does it appeal? How might I explore that in a different way? Who might be living here that I can learn something from, even if I'm adamantly against the idea of living in that close of a community arrangement? I have a, a really good friend, and um, we often talk about the fact that we'll end up together living with lots of cats. That's yes. kind, of, <laughs> kind of our plan. The only, the only difference is I've got to get rid of the husband and the children first. But, you know, that's the long-term plan is <laughs> yeah. that I will be there. Right. I will be there with the lots of Siamese cats don't know why Siamese but Siamese cats I've had a similar similar conversation with a girlfriend here I think it's like the ideal isn't it that you just get all your girlfriends in one place I mean it'd be brilliant yeah it would be fantastic how do you respond to the question do you have kids because that's such a social question isn't it in any social environment you go to and you meet somebody new for the first time they might ask you what you do for a living and then the next question is do you have children or even how many children do you have that expectation that you will have a child. How have you learned, Kate, to respond well, to that question? Before I can even talk about how to respond to the question, I think it behooves all of us to step back a little bit from the question because it is, it is such a complex question and there's so many assumptions that are rolled up in the, in the question itself. And I actually look at it as a whole series of questions that we wouldn't ask individually in order to get to the answers like, hey, you having sex? Hey, did you get pregnant? Hey, you know. And so there's a whole series of questions we would never, ever ask. And yet we have created this overall question that we think is an easy question, and it's not. So therein lies the opportunity is to say, all right, I'm going to be asked a question that otherwise I would have it be a jaw-dropping kind of an experience. And I have to recognize for others, my response when I'm going to say no, I already know that answer. So my job is to figure out in this particular time that I'm being asked this question that for everyone, we are going to be asked this question for the rest of our lives. We know the answer. And so we can prepare, put it on a three by five card, put it on your phone, a whole series of options that cover when we're feeling tender and vulnerable by something like, I don't, and please excuse me, I need to go uh, across the room, I see someone I have been looking for, to do the kind of self-care that takes one out of the conversation, to take a moment to say, I don't, and here's what's been interesting me lately, so shifting the, shifting the whole conversation in a direction that I'm more ready and willing to go to than the whole kid question, all the way up to, no, I don't. Um, I'm assuming that you may, because you're asking the question, do you know other people who don't have kids? How often have you talked about it with them? Um, how do you feel about how our lives might be different? So to, to have a whole repertoire of responses to the question that we know we're going to get and we know when you don't have kids can be problematic, not only for us, but for the people with whom we're speaking, because they're playing the odds that the answer is going to be yes, and it's going to be a conversation just like if you're talking about sport or weather or any other topic that is an easy entree when, in fact, for many of us, it's not an easy entree. I was just reading when you were talking about that, about the conversation that you shared that happened on uh, Hillary Frank's The Longest Shortest Time where that question was, was asked. I was just quite interested in that the way the conversation changed about do you ever have a second thought about having a child because you were talking about you know what the expectation of the the answer might or might not be I mean that's a bit of a sideball that one isn't it yes and that is I mean the the response that Terry Gross gave to the interviewer's question on that I thought was brilliant because she offered her response and answered in an honest way and then she asked a really honest follow-up question and so the stage was set by the way their conversation had flowed. I have to say that the afterword in my book, which is a, a, an actual, it's the only real how-to part, I felt compelled to write that as I finished the main part of the book, which goes through the full life cycle of, here's all the impacts of not having children on those different aspects of life. And I thought, what do I want the reader to be compelled to do? 
And it was to have conversations in a different way. And so I thought, ooh, I guess what mm. I need to do is describe to the reader different optional plug-in points, whether you're a mom who's asked the question and has just heard the answer no, whether you're someone who doesn't have kids, who is getting ready to see that look of surprise and, and have that silent space that follows how to fill that, or, and this was the most exciting part for me to write, was when you encounter those, those other minority representations in our populations of women or men who don't have kids, how can we explore that experience between us in a rich and meaningful way? And you talk about as well in that kind of afterward, the, the differences between non-mums and mothers. Do you want to just mention a, a, a few of those? Because you're talking about how to converse with one another. I think one of the, the, the most powerful parts as I have been participating in book groups and doing speaking, and I love it when parents have read the book because there's an open-hearted frankness that comes out that sounds something like, you know what, I have to admit, I have not put very much thought into what your life might be like. And that to me is so rich because it says, oh, now I'm curious. And now I'm also feeling a little more humble about what your experience may have been. And there's a list of uh, what you see referred to sometimes as bingo questions that when you don't have kids are often responses that we get that can be problematic and yet are not seen in the same way as they can be received. Example would be, oh, but you'd be such a perfect mom. Well, that was a really very painful response to hear when I was going through infertility, when any woman is going through, or man is going through infertility. It's a difficult response to hear. And there's a whole list of those responses that are, they border on cliche, and that's why they're referred to as bingos. And for parents to see those listed in black and white and to go, oh my goodness, I never considered it from that point of view. That's when we're having any more challenging conversation on any topic. When that light bulb goes off, oh my goodness, I think that's when the real learning and richness can come into relationship, whether in families, uh, with dear friends, or with people that we're just meeting. One um, thing actually that your book made me think about was grandchildren. Because if you're kind of going through all of this and coming to terms with not having children, being childless, and moving forward in your life with, you know, in the hope that eventually you have some acceptance and you have a very fulfilled, happy life. Yet it's, and then it all comes back around again, doesn't it? When suddenly all your friends are having grandchildren. And then you've got that whole emotion again is that there are no grandchildren. So do you, did you kind of, do you feel that you're reliving it again <laughs> after a period Absolutely. of time? And for me personally, and, and in the book, I, you had mentioned that there's research findings, and that is the case. The women that I profiled in different aspects and phases of their lives. And then I ended up, I didn't want to, but I'm glad that I did, ended up weaving in my own story. And the grandparenting element of, of my life experience was such a surprise. And I tell younger people when they go, oh, finally this is going to be done. It's like, ooh, get ready. It's going to come back. Just get ready, yeah. Because mm. and, and then what I've also found is that women who have children but don't have grandchildren, that's a really rich conversation point because in many ways the way we look at our elder years, we have much more in common. And I have had women who, whose children are not for whatever reason having children We've been able to have some very rich conversations about how do we look at, at those latter years and what kind of arrangements do we make and how do we think about our legacies and what, what we're leaving behind because it's different than when you have grandchildren to carry on your line and your stuff and your, your ear shape. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Where did that come from? Important air shape. But you talk as well in the acknowledgement, you say what started as a walk on the beach has since snowboarded into hundreds of conversations. And I imagine it's like 
the experience I've had with this podcast that you're just constantly like just baffled by the many different ways in which people are affected by this and the many relationships that you start to build and you, you talk early on in the book about the Not Mum Summit, which uh, Kay and I wanted to know more about. And then as, before we started talking, you mentioned that that's where you'd met Jodie Day, who's been a, a guest before on this podcast and someone that I've met numerous times. And, and I know that, Kate, you were very um, interested in meeting Jodie. The relationships and the experiences that you've gained out of this have obviously been life-changing. The fact that you've got this, this remarkable book out that you said has taken a decade to, to put together and has come out this year, in 2019. Just tell us a bit about that Not Mom Summit. And I know you were involved with World Childless Week, which was in September. Tell us more about kind of what's happening now as a result of these conversations in the book. Oh, what's happening now? The Not Mom Summit was put together by Karen Malone Wright and it happened in 2015 and again in 2017. And the palpable difference of walking into a space where you knew in advance that everyone there did not have children was a remarkable experience and one that I know happens very rarely. And it happens to the extent now that when I have any group of people together that I have the privilege of speaking with, I'll poll the group for what is our makeup of being parents versus not being parents. And whenever we have the reverse demographic where the non-parents outweigh the number of parents, I ask both groups to just notice that and let it sink in. If you're a parent, to notice what it feels like to be in the minority of numbers in the room. And for those who don't have kids, to just let seep in, knowing that there are more of you there than, than not, because it happens so, so, so very rarely. And so the idea of being able to open up conversations and to include our presence in the room, whether it's through the Not Mom Summit, whether it's through the beautiful podcast work that you're doing, whether it's through running into someone on the street or at a book event, or anything. There are conversations happening now through World Childless Week all over the world and through social media. And those relationships are so rich and so precious that uh, I, I think we're living in a golden time. There's beautiful writing that's coming out, whether it be in articles or in full-length books that are all hitting this topic from so many different directions. There's a richness that uh, we're very fortunate to be accumulating i mean i think it's it's quite a journal i mean there's the stories as we've said but the facts there and um i think the research that you've shared different books that people can refer to i think it makes it a really interesting piece of work that i hope you are you are you feeling quite proud of the book after this decade oh it's not only that i i feel proud which i do what i feel more is a sense of mission and purpose that has never been so clearly established in my life if we can move through our collective work, some of the stigmas and stereotypes that have attached to childlessness and to the child-free, if we can move the needle on that towards the center of understanding, oh my God, my life will have totally been worth living and we'll all be a little more inclusive in, in the world. Just one more thing that just struck me there because you talked about moving that needle and one of the points you talked about was your faith. And there was a comment you'd said about how in Orthodox Judaism, uh, it wasn't you, sorry, it was one of the ladies, Beth, who you'd spoken to. She talked about how in Orthodox Judaism, having children is the purpose of marriage. And when we talk about the narrative and moving the needle and there are such strong beliefs in society and especially in different faiths, we've still got quite a bit of work to do, haven't we? Yes, we do. And... That being said, the fact of the matter is there have always been people who don't have children. There always will be people who don't have children. And you're mentioning Beth. Beth has, has taught in her synagogue school for years. And when we reflect on any educational system, there's always people who don't have kids that are, are so desperately involved in creating the kinds of future generations just in different ways. So we can be laser focused on our children and their peers, or we can be more broadly focused in not that same level of depth. And all of it fits together just so vitally and crucially, building healthy communities. Yeah. 
Definitely. Well, Kate, it's been lovely chatting to you. And best of luck with the book. Can people get it on Amazon? Where can they get get hold of it? Is it general generally available worldwide? You can get it on Amazon. It's been published recently in the UK. It's in the States. You can get it from any bookseller. And yes, it's widely available. And I'm just thrilled with the way this starting the conversation. So it's a definite recommended read. I have um, a couple of friends queuing up to borrow it. So I'll be passing it on <laughs> as, as long as they don't mind my turn down pages. I've, I've also notes. made notes on mine. <laughs> I've made notes and highlighted it so they're going to be well loved copies Kate it's been really lovely chatting with you best of luck with the book and if we do get to meet up in Jodie Day's place in Ibiza then that will be one heck of a little celebration (laughs) big celebration I will look forward to it such a nice conversation with Kate the show notes for this episode are thefertilitypodcast.com forward slash do you have kids And there you can find a link to Kate's website and also all the things I mentioned at the start of this chat about the fertility education poster and about Fertilibox with that discount code. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast, rate and review it, subscribe and share it. And I will love you even more than I already do for giving your ongoing support. And until the next time. 